Okay, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to this uh, spotlight talk. I'm uh, Giorgio Veronesi, I'm president of the European Federation of Chemical Engineering. I've been in the board of EFC in the various positions for almost eight years, and now I'm currently in my second year as president. I am a chemical engineer by training, graduated in Padua, Italy, and I've been spending the whole of my career in the engineering construction business, involved in many projects, mainly abroad with uh, several assignments, long assignments overseas. I'm very happy to be involved in the introduction of this webinar on quality by design, and I'm looking forward to participating into it. Uh, let me say first some, something about this uh, webinar series. EFC is organizing a series of virtual talks on significant topics in chemical engineering. This is now our fourth year of the initiative, which started in 2020 to keep together the community during the COVID pandemic. The success of the previous years convinced the management of EFC to transform the spotlight talk in a regular feature of our program. Nine of our working parties and sections, uh, quality by design, multi-phase fluid flow, high pressure technology, chemical engineering applied to medicine, static electricity, early career chemical engineers, crystallization, characterization of particulate systems, loss prevention and safety promotion, thermodynamics and transport uh, properties, are delivering over a period of two weeks, short session of three or four talks, focus on specific topics by leading industrial and academic experts. The series also enables attendees to sample matters in areas that they find interesting, but may not otherwise have had the opportunity to attend before. In this way, we want to encourage cross-fertilization between specialist areas. Uh, links to the next talks are available when you register for this event or via the EFC website. EFC promotes scientific collaboration and supports the work of chemical engineers in 30 European countries, representing more than 100,000 of them in Europe. And uh, EFC working parties and sections cover all major specific aspects of chemical engineering and are in fact the core of the organization, forming the scientific engine that drives many of EFC activities. They provide an important forum for technical exchange and networking among chemical engineers in Europe. And I'm particularly happy that in this series of Spotlight Talks, we will have the first contribution of the two, two newest sections of EFC, Chemical Engineering Applied to Medicine and Early Career Chemical Engineers. Before concluding, I would like to thank all the people who work hard inside the working parties, sections, and the EFC in general for this initiative to happen and uh, to be successful. And in particular, I would like to thank uh, Martin Pou in Toulouse, who did most of the conceptual setting up and also practical activities. So many thanks again, Martin, for all you have done. I thank you for your attention and wish all the speakers and the attendees a fruitful and uh, successful uh, webinar. And then I would like to give back the word to the chair of the Working Party on Quality by Design, Professor Christoph Herving of Vienna, to start the works. Please, uh, Christoph, go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Giorgio, for this nice introduction, the possibility to have a visibility for the Working Party on Quality by Design. Uh, which I am sharing. And uh, as an introduction into that, I also uh, would like to shortly uh, introduce you to this working party. Um, so I'm uh, going just to, uh, to uh, show you um, the working party website, uh, which you can find here under this link here, and uh, which introduces you to quality by design for those of you which are probably uh, not aware, I think that's the main definition of quality by design, I just read a systematic approach to development that begins with predefined objectives and emphasizes and focuses mainly on product and process understanding. So the link between quality attributes, both parameters, raw material attributes, right, based on sound science and quality risk management, just to give you uh, the, the idea. 
Um, so, and of course, there are a couple of guidelines which uh, are historically born, etc., along that line. Uh, but I'd say what you also see in this webinar is that we are actually ap uh, applying uh, quality by design principles as a methodology um, here to the life cycle uh, of uh, the product um, and, of course, to decrease time to market acceleration of commercialization. With all the elements which you finally see here, you will definitely uh, uh, find some examples uh, of successful implementation of quality by design uh, addressing exactly these points which are here. Uh, when you think about the mission of the working party, uh, we want, of course, to provide very clear workflows, uh, how to really uh, apply uh, uh, quality by design, how to implement uh, quality by design in practice. And of course, uh, therefore, uh, we are trying to deliver uh, here a conference series like we are doing now, shaping uh, tracks inside of European conferences. Uh, and of course, we also uh, would like to do more in the direction of blogs, white papers, etc., which are read in the scientific as well as the industrial uh, community. And therefore, of course, you see uh, the, the main objectives. We want to promote quality by design. Uh, we want uh, to have a suitable forum for dissemination of research results like we do here, but of course, also in publications. Um, uh, promote cross-disciplinary exchange of knowledge and ideas. Uh, also here today, you will uh, hear a couple of uh, different uh, market segments. And of course, it's a platform for collaboration. With this one having said, uh, please join us. Please join us, uh, write us uh, uh, that you are interested in actually getting more involved and um, uh, retrieve benefits. With that one said, I directly jump into um, the Spotlight series, uh, Seminar of uh, today. And um, I have the pleasure uh, to, uh, to introduce you here to uh, this uh, Spotlight on successful implementation of quality by design along the product lifecycle, industrial use cases. I'm happy to have uh, two people from industry here on board. And um, I will uh, first give the word uh, here uh, to Gabriele, uh, Bano, he's uh, in uh, uh, working at JSK uh, in uh, the USA in Collegeville, and uh, he is uh, um, heading process analytics, drug product development. With everyone having said, uh, Gabriela, I'll just give you the word, the floor is yours. Thomas um, is uh, head of innovation of Körper Pharma Austria uh, in Vienna, and uh, has a PhD in biopost technology and data science. Um, and I think with this one, I don't want to spend too much time more and uh, give directly the word to Thomas. Please go ahead with the holistic design and experiment approach. Thanks a lot, Christoph, for the nice introduction. I hope you can see uh, also my screen. Um, yes, we can. Yes. Great. Speak up okay. a little bit. It's a bit, bit. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I can, I can raise my voice a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, please. Um, go ahead. Yeah. So yeah, my talk will be about holistic design of experiments, which is a new um, accelerated pathway to process understanding. And this series is actually about QBD across the product lifecycle, as Christoph mentioned at the beginning. And this is why I want to start with my view of the product lifecycle. Um, and we heard something very similar from Gabriele just before. Um, there are certain steps you need to take in the manufacturing before you can start manufacturing. Uh, it's uh, process development, scale up tech transfer, doing a process validation um, before you get your filing uh, and you're allowed to do manufacturing. And all of these steps have certain challenges. And uh, we heard from, a, uh, from JSK perspective that um, coming to, to the market um, approval and reaching market approval is definitely critical and will be more critical in future as uh, we need to be faster on the market. And uh, in order to do so, in order to be faster on the market, we need to understand the challenges of each of those steps, like heterogeneous data in process development, inaccessible data and in check transfer, but also when it comes to process validation, um, a huge experimental effort um, that leads to long time to market, which means that we usually spend years on doing process characterization work. We spend hundreds of, literally hundreds of experiments to understand the process parameters impact on the quality and on the yield. Um, 
And if we don't do that part correctly, we will not be able to write our IND and BLA filing according to this ICAHQ 9, 10, 11 standards. And we miss to establish a holistic or even adaptive control strategy, we just heard about, um, that will then be useful uh, later in manufacturing to prevent failed batches to really decrease the out of specification rate and deviations. Um, this is actually the life cycle. It should uh, be able to identify um, special cause variations and make investigations on that, which is usually impeded by silos as these steps are executed by different departments in industry. So process development is executed at different, uh, definitely by different people than the manufacturing. It's operated by the way, or it's performed years um, before manufacturing starts. And um, these silos really impede the data and information flow across um, the different departments. And today I want to present also a little bit uh, a technology that can be seen as a Trojan horse. So some would also connect these different cultural aspects also we heard um, and really connect people via a um, common platform. When it comes to um, QBD um, and thinking about what is the core, and I thought about what is my core plot, I would, or we, we need to show at any of those steps of the product lifecycle to regulatory agencies, then I would come up uh, with this plot. <laughs> this plot here, um, this one, which shows that we are consistently able to deliver product quality in our drug substance or drug product. Um, I mean, it could also be yield. We heard that yield is also important, but if you don't compile with um, specification limits, you're not able to release a batch and you anyway lose the entire batch. So both aspects need to be balanced as we also heard in the previous talk. Um, to, or in order to generate such a plot that shows that the majority of your runs are within specification limits, um, we really need to ask the question, how could we build a model that gives us exactly this plot. And uh, for that, we need to look maybe how it's actually done in industry at the moment. And usually the people perform three steps. They do a risk assessment for each individual unit operation. So they sit together, think about what are the critical process, potentially critical process parameters of my fermentation. They come up with pH, temperature, dissolved oxygen. They do some experimental planning around it. They could either do a DOE, a mechanistic model, whatever it is analyze it and put it into a model, but re rarely investigate uh, the interactions between the unit operation. So usually the models, um, also we have seen in the previous talks, they enable us to do um, statements about if I change my feed rate, if I change my pH at uh, the fermentation step, how will this impact the quality at the end of uh, my fermentation process? Um, we rarely have information about how does this really impact on the quality that we, uh, on the product that we deliver to the patient. And for that, I would like to take you on a journey um, and on a schematic illustration how such end-to-end -end or integrated process models can look like and how they need to be trained. For that, I use this schematic picture of a manufacturing process, which consists of um, three processing steps. Uh, we are interested in these final packages, which are delivered here. Um, and let's assume that each of these co-workers we see here of the three co-workers performs differently under different conditions. So operator A might perform better on Monday than on Friday. Uh, he also might perform better if he's relaxed or stressed out. And in a typical biopharmaceutical engineering and process development context, now we would do experiments to study each of these operators. And I just want to know that I don't advocate doing any experiments with operators, but I just use this as a very illustrative example here. So we would do maybe 50 experiments on Monday and check the operator's ACE performance, do 50 experiments on Friday. And so we have a really good understanding how our operator A performs on Monday and on Friday. However, imagine we would do a single experiment that shows that if we take an error-prone package from operator A, deliver it to operator B, and observe that operator B will compensate or fix the errors that have been introduced by operator A then we might be fully okay with having just a really vague understanding how operator A works. We might just do five experiments on Monday and five on Friday, and even don't know if it really performs better on Monday than on Friday, but we don't care as we anyway know that we have a safeguard in terms of operator B in a place 
that can fix the errors. So what I want to illustrate here is that we don't only need to understand each individual operating step of our process, but we also need to understand inter interaction between these steps in order to reduce the experimental amount and hence also the time to market drastically. For that, we need an end-to-end -end digital twin. We need an, what we call here an integrated process model that serves as a platform to incorporate different models into one giant integrated process model. You can introduce in these type of models different um, types of models. So you could have a order least squares regression model to predict your fermentation performance. Um, it could be a um, hybrid or AI model, which is heard about for fermentation processes or chromatography processes. It could be a linear mixed model, whatever it is, uh, and combine it in a, a large model. And in order to not be too abstract here, I really want to sh show a use case because this was also, um, I think, in the um, announcement of this set series that we want to go into use cases. And I really want to show you how such a model can look like in 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 reality. For that, I switch to um, to this um, software. It doesn't matter which software it is. I just use it here for illustration purposes. And what you see here is a typical manufacturing monoclonal antibody to really stick to the theme. Um, it's consisting of an upstream step at the beginning, then having a protein A column, a couple of other steps you see, um, and finally a formulation process. And each of these process steps, these unit operations, uh, has a se sequence of or a series of process parameters, like the feed rate in upstream, a pH value of the upstream, or um, a pH value of a protein A column. Uh, and each of these process parameters has a set point indicated by the peak of this blue distribution and the variability. The variability can be seen as a batch to batch variability. We know that operators are not perfect, equipment is not perfect, hence we need to take this input variability into account to make proper predictions of what will happen in future. Down here, you see three quality attributes we measure across uh, the um, course of our process. It could be also the yield we want to model, but for now, it's just three quality attributes. Um, I will focus now uh, on the main peak purity. Um, this is the purity we want to achieve. Uh, um, so there's a purity um, specification of 74, around 74% uh, we want to achieve at least um, for our final product quality. What you see in this, what we call here a process trend plot is uh, the historical runs indicated by the markers and lines. So there have been 10 campaigns performed and we see the quality after each of these steps. And superimposed to the historical runs, we see the prediction of our integrated process model indicated by these distributions, the green distributions. Most interestingly is the distribution at the very end of our process. This is also the distribution I've shown at the beginning of my talk. We really want to show regulatory bodies um, that we are able to consistently deliver product quality, meaning that we should have a distribution that has no out of specification or, or as little as possible um, out of specification probability. If we use the integrated process model to make a prediction of what the future manufacturing will be, we will see here that in this specific case, we will find 7.1%, these are these um, runs of the distribution, being outside the specification limit, below the specification limit. We can now use the integrated process model to play around literally with any process parameter um, and um, run a, what we'll later learn, a Monte Carlo simulation to give us um, the idea what happens if you change the feed rate in the upstream. It will likely change the quality after the upstream step, but will it also impact the quality at the end of the process? And if we scroll down here, we already see the result. We see that, yes, we could increase the quality after the upstream step compared to the historical runs, but we could also slightly increase the quality at the end of our process. And we could go from seven to around 1.6% out of spec rate. So we could increase, the num like decrease the number of failed batches by 5%. And we just heard that one run can even be worth 10 millions. So it's, it's a huge monetary benefit. Um, in addition, um, these integrated process models enable us to um, define criticality, which, is def which you can see here by this um, 
numbers next to each process parameter. So apparently the loading density is pretty critical for the main peak purity. I can switch also here the different quality attributes and the criticality changes. Um, I can um, directly go to the loading density and play around with the loading density. Let's assume I have a certain run that's operated at the low loading density uh, and, and then view what the prediction will tell us. In this case, it will have really drastic um, consequence, um, our, our auto specification probability of um, the future or a current running batch is then already at 31%. Um, and you want to make counter actions um, and might want to turn any other wheel here um, that will compensate for that error and will move the run back into, um, into an area where um, the likelihood of being inside the specification is again increased. Okay, with this tool, I hope I could have shown you that um, it's easy to establish a holistic control strategy. So setting the set points and the variability of each of the process parameter in a way to really receive um, a plot that, that maybe looks like this, where you can confidently um, show the regulatory agencies, the bodies, that you're consistently producing um, high product quality and a sufficiently high amount because usually these two things are going vice versa. So whenever you increase um, the product amount, this is true for upstream processes um, and for downstream processes, the product quality goes down and vice versa. This makes sense, like bacterial or microbial uh, and, and mammalian cell cultures are the same as we human. If we are stressed, we usually make errors. And the same is true for chromatography columns. If you think about um, uh, either you could have uh, you have cut no separation, right? You, you simply um, collect all your fractions into the pool. Then you have 100% yield, but you have all the impurities. And, uh, or you can decide to have only a fraction of the illusion um, collected into the pool. Then you will um, also get a lower yield. So these two things are vice versa and you need to balance them. Okay, so now you, the next question you might have in my, your mind is how do I really get to such a model? I, I mean, it's, it looks great, but um, how do I get to such an integrated process model that make, that allows me to make all these statements? And the question can be answered as soon as I understand how this model works under the hood. And this is shown on, on this slide. It is essentially a Monte Carlo simulation we perform here. So if you focus on the first unit operation here, we see a very easy depiction of the linear regression model. Again, you could use any uh, model. It could be a time dynamic model. It could be a hybrid model um, that you plug into the series of, of, of unit operations here. But this linear regression model here uh, concatenates, oh, sorry, um, correlates uh, the impact of a process parameter with the quality attribute. And in a Monte Carlo fashion, you don't only use one single process parameter setting, but you can propagate a distribution of process parameters through the model in order to receive a distribution of quality attributes at the end of that unit operation. The variability of the quality can be reduced if we also reduce the variability in our process parameters. It makes sense if we control our process better, we get um, more consistent quality, but it can also be reduced if we reduce the uncertainty of the model here indicated by the prediction intervals of um, the model. And these prediction intervals can be reduced to some degree if we add more training data either to our DOE models or to our mechanistic models or hybrid models. However, the prediction intervals will never collapse to zero because uh, in, 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 if, if you add an infinite number of runs into your training data set, the prediction intervals will converge towards the true process variability, including the analytical variability. To be precise, statistically, you should use tolerance intervals but I guess prediction intervals are more familiar to most of you. Now, um, so adding new runs to such a model seems to be beneficial because it re reduces the model uncertainty, but the integrated process model is more than that. It's um, also taking um, the interaction between the unit operations into account. So it essentially takes the output of one unit operation and uses it as an input, which is called here load, of the second unit operation. So uh, this, in, um, this kind of relationship we see here is the input-output relationship. So you can think that uh, this distribution and this distribution are totally equivalent to each other. And uh, 
in a perfect world of a downstream unit operation, you would have see a horizontal line here, which means that regardless of what I load onto a column, I will always get the same high product quality at the end. Yeah? And if I can establish such a knowledge using some data or mechanistic information, for example, using spiking data, spiking study data that shows even if I load a very unpure product on my column, I will still receive good product quality. I really don't care if the first model is pretty unsecure or if I have a bad control of my first unit operation, as I anyway know that my downstream steps may be able to compensate it. Of course, there might be scenarios where the downstream is not able to compensate it, and I want to know about these scenarios as well. The second unit operation also has process parameters, and they also have an impact on quality. And you want to combine these both outputs together to receive a final output of unit operation two and to treat this as an input of unit operation three, four, and so on and so forth, as many unit operations you have in your system to finally get uh, the quality distribution in drug substance or drug product. You can always extend that, can even include um, supply chain operations in here or shelf life estimations into the integrated process model. In order to get such a nice picture as you see here, where the majority of your runs are within the specification limits, you can do three things. First of all, and this is what we just did together, you can play around with the process parameter settings of the feed rate or loading density, as we just did, done before, to get um, uh, more runs into your specification limits. But sometimes you, this is not possible because you either have counteracting effects, as I explained, with yield and quality, or you have um, very unsecure models, like high model uncertainties, and you will have a very broad distribution at the end of your process, hence also having a lot of out of specification runs to be expected. In this case, you can either add more training data to the individual unit operations, so studying the individual unit operations better in mechanistic models or DOE models, or investigate more in the interaction and study the interaction between the unit operations, for example, by employing spiking experiments. Okay, so now you know that there might be an opportunity to um, really get to such models by building DOE or spiking data, but you might ask the question, what, how do I know which exact experiment do I need to perform? So which exact DOE or spiking experiment do you need to perform? And this is like, exactly why we developed a um, new technology last year, uh, which we call holistic design of experiment, which is a recommender system that tells you exactly at which unit operation to perform which run. This recommender system works as follows. You start with a very rudimentary experimental setup. You, so, so you do maybe five um, runs, uh, like you could think about the de-optimal design for each unit operation with five runs. So you have a very rough understanding of what's going on. Um, you build a model per unit operation, um, build an integrated process model. And at the beginning, this rudimentary, rudimentary integrated process model with all, with, with, with all, only has a vague understanding about the individual unit operations and how they work together will likely produce a high out of specification rate. It tells you, I don't know a lot. In this case, the recommender system will um, tell you uh, either to perform a DOE run or a spiking run. And once you add this data and update your integrated process model, you will get the new prediction of uh, your out of spec rate. And if that is within the required um, limits, or like you say, okay, I'm, I'm fine with having an OS rate of 2% or 5%, then you can stop the process. Otherwise, it will recommend the next run for you. And so it's an iterative process that always recommends um, the next or multiple next runs for you. I guess it's easier to understand this concept once you see it in real life. So I've also prepared a small uh, video on this. Um, I hope it, it plays. Okay, it does not. <laughs> um, let me check that for a second. I will just pull out the actual video for you, which is tested that in beforehand, but it doesn't work now. Okay, here it is. Just bring it to the right screen and then um, share again. Okay, sorry for the inconvenience. 
So um, in this video, I, I demonstrate um, that we start with an initial integrated process model um, where we just have a very small amount of training data in there. And we'll likely get to a situation which you see here where we have a high uncertainty at each unit operation and also at the end of the process model, um, which is indicated by this 20% out of spec rate here. So it's uh, really not the picture you want to show the regulatory agencies and also not to your management that 20% of your runs will fail in future. So what you will do in, in this um, scenario, you can go to a tab, which we call here um, holistic design of experiments. And it will ask you for which quality attribute or tighter I want to optimize my process. Here I choose the main peak purity. I can add spiking limits, which are kind of um, uh, practical boundaries I don't want to surpass with my experiments. I choose how many experiments I want to perform. And then I let the system recommend the next five best runs to perform. And here it tells us um, the first run should be performed in unit operation one. The X1 to X5 mean that are the process parameters of that unit operation. It tells you which process parameter settings to choose. If you go for a classical DOE design, this is now like this use case works with the classical DOE design at the moment. And um, once you run this um, process, like this one experiment, and it, it performs out to be successful, it will reduce your auto specification rate to around 20%. If you look for the second best um, experiment, you will see it's a, it has set points in, in its process parameters. It's a spiking experiment with only 10% main peak purity um, at the load, which means that we will have usually, as you see here, I hope you can see it, it's around 60% main peak purity. We usually have at uh, the third unit operation, but we'll challenge the third unit operation by just adding 10% main peak purity. So we we'll see what happens. If that turns out to be successful, we will go down to 16.7% and so on and so forth until we perform all the five experiments and we will um, get to an out-of-spec rate of only 1.5% with just doing five experiments because it has been, have been the right five experiments that we conducted. Yeah? So what we did in, in, um, in, um, in, in a simulation study, I need to switch again back to my um, presentation here. Um, we, we, we simulated uh, a standard state-of-the-art process characterization work. So we used the typical biopharmaceutical manufacturing process of a monoclonal antibody and said, okay, we usually take, it takes us overall, over all the four or five unit operations we study around 90 experiments. Um, and we reach a process understanding um, depicted by a out of, out of specification rate of around 8%. Um, the same uh, level can be achieved with our holistic design of experiment, where we also investigate the interaction of the unit operations via spiking experiments way earlier. So the state-of-the-art process characterization work was only doing uh, the uh, design of experiments per unit operation individually. So it was more or less living in the silos of each unit operation. The holistic design of experiment was really planning also to investigate the interaction between the unit operations. And if we do that, we see that we can save around 70% of the runs. And hence, we are way faster in our time to market journey and we can way faster go uh, for manufacturing. This is only one of the benefits we have once we establish an integrated process model, which can then later also be used in manufacturing for monitoring and control purposes, even in closed loop or, or real time. Okay, I will conclude here. I hope I could have demonstrated that this holistic design of experiment is an iterative tool you can use for process development and characterization to establish integrated or end-to-end -end process models. It reduces the experimental effort by more than 50%, as we've shown in the peer-reviewed publication last year. Um, it also reduces um, the cost and the time to market, consequently. Uh, it can be integrated in typical uh, process characterization workflows, you know. Uh, it's not something super special, except of the fact that you also study how your unit operations work together. And it enables you, once you have an integrated process model to establish a holistic control strategy, it also enables you to monitor your process and to control your process in a holistic fashion. Yeah, with that, I hope um, I could have um, at least 
increased your interest in in in, in this topic and I'm, I'm looking forward to some questions thanks a lot yeah thank you so much uh, thomas for this uh, interesting contribution here uh, linking the individual models together and uh, not only looking at robustness but coming back also to um, holistic experimental design which actually closes the loop also to what gabriela actually showed at the beginning to model experiments before doing it, right? And um, this is probably also directly uh, one of the questions um, here, Gabriela. Uh, there was a question just getting in. Thank you for the questions for Manuela. Um, so in case uh, the, yeah, here I just read that, in the case of the problem that the raw material was probably not really included in the model, how do you really then uh, find that out or how do you actually make sure that the model actually predicts the right stuff? Yeah, so well, thanks Manuela for the question. Um, so when we when we perform process development activities, uh, we use models indeed to quantify impact of raw material properties on, on output. However, what we cannot predict is what's the expected lot to lot variability in those raw materials when we move to commercial operation. So when we move to commercial operation, it depends on specific suppliers to provide those raw materials to us. And although they need to meet some uh, strict specifications, there is still, still a certain level of variability, lot to lot, depending on what the supplier gives us. So for the specific example I've shown, um, there was a specific component within that yeastolate, an amino acid, uh, that was at a lower level than expected. And unfortunately, monoclonal antibodies are known to be extremely sensitive to what uh, is being fed, sorry, the cell lines that we use to produce monoclonal antibodies, they are extremely sensitive to what we feed to them. So in that scenario, uh, we, we couldn't incorporate that impact simply because we, we it's hard for us to predict what's expected level of lot to lot variability on those raw materials in uh, from, from the supplier. Um, that caught us a little bit, I would say, uh, surprised uh, in a bit. Uh, but, but you make a good point. Once we do and uh, we run process development activities, we do robustness studies enabled by modeling where we use scenario simulations in order to cope what how raw material changes in raw material might impact our uh, yield tighter or quality specifications. And this was a very peculiar case uh, where uh, we really had a lot of material which was uh, pretty nasty in a way compared mm -hmm. to the others. Yeah. Probably just uh, mentioning these raw material attributes, and uh, these are random effects which you actually have, right? Uh, Thomas, uh, probably you also, you've also published on random effects. Can yeah. you probably just add on this? How you yeah, I, I would like to like to that? yeah, I would like to add on this that that for, for one client we we, we exact, exactly did that um, that we in statistics we divided into some fixed effects you can model you can really also control in future, but other things as you explained lot to lot variables you cannot control in future and hence you want to already note about this them in in your process development work or process characterization work and you try to include a couple of those vendors into your experimental design in process development to have some idea of what will happen in future of course you're right you will not have the full like you will not be able to include a hundred raw material lot vendors but um, a couple of ones in order to understand how well do i need to control the rest of my process in order to compensate for possible lot-to-lot -lot variability which might occur. Mm -hmm. Absolutely true, right, indeed. And then, of course, we, we have the discussions on uh, yeah, uh, pros and cons of data-driven uh, versus hybrid or mechanistic models. Of course, the hybridity of these models um, are, of course, uh, questionable. And, of course, just if you have a clearly just data-driven tool, what kind of, um, let's say, message you can really deduct from there. And I think I really have shown that, of course, finally, it will be a hybrid, right? And there was a question on, of course, uh, how does, let's say, this hybrid approach relates in terms of the data required for calibration, material usage, quality, and escalation of the model predictions compared to the data-driven approach? Yeah, maybe I can go first on this. So, um, but that's, that's a good question, first of all, Niall. I think, uh, you know, obviously, when we, if you look at the process development workflow, right, in pharma, we start from a data poor situation when the project is in phase one, 
to a data rich situation where we start making commercial batches on a continuous basis. So in terms of application of data driven approaches, I think as we approach the manufacturing stage, meaning phase three of a project or launch, then the, the amount of data we can collect uh, uh, that would allow us to build a reliable data driven model for say monitoring purposes at commercial scale, uh, that's where the data-driven, at least in GSK, data-driven modeling is heavily used. For the mechanistic hybrid modeling part, right, uh, where they add most of the value to me is in two things, right? First is when we are in that data-poor situation, a project which is in early phase moving to mid-phase, and that's really, they help us designing what are the best experiments we can make. To, to, to develop and scale up our process quickly. But specifically for monoclonal antibodies, the advantage of those models is that all the equipment, uh, small scale equipment uh, or scale up equipment that we use for monoclonal antibody process scale up, say Amber 250 or three liter bioreactor, 50 liter bioreactors, the data we generate at those scales, they might not be fully representative of behavior that we will observe at commercial scale. And therefore a data-driven model built at that scale might not necessarily or almost certainly will not be able to predict and extrapolate behavior at commercial scale. But what hybrid, model, hybrid modeling gives you is by having the mechanistic backbone and then potentially combining the data-driven component on the metabolomic part, uh, with small scale data, it does allow you to have uh, enhanced extrapolation ability at commercial scale, which is at the end of the day is what you're really interested in, right? You want the process that works in a 2000 liter bioreactor, not in a three liter bioreactor. So I see the two approaches as complementary and the application is really um, a different phases of development, uh, but also the hybrid part really gives you that extrapolation ability that a full a pure data driven model cannot give you. Yeah, I fully, fully agree. And I think um, as I have seen, uh, Thomas, in your IPM, I think it looks like you can, of course, use all kind of different uh, uh, models, let's say, in your, uh, in your IPM. I think that's clear. You can exactly. incorporate different tools. Uh, but still, okay, uh, probably going a little bit deeper, uh, what is the difference between typical just statistical multivariate process control as Gabriele has shown, compared to, to the IPM, what you have shown, where do you see the main differences? Right, I, I see the main difference in, in, in the fact that, um, and maybe I can share, share one slide on that as well, um, how, how data is generated and uh, how, how we facilitate um, the usage of data. Um, uh, when, we, when we perform a, a chemometrical model, like a PCA model, then we usually assume that we have a full data matrix, which means that we have features from manufacturing runs, which are processed through all the steps of our process. But the reality in, in process development and where the, I, th I think there is the real treasure of our information when it comes to connecting process parameters and quality attributes, is different so we do maybe some doe runs here or mechanistic model here but we don't have information how um, these runs would perform at the further steps right um, and so we have only a limited extrapolation possibility uh, from i would say uh, manufacturing scale runs uh, when it comes to extrapolating in the process parameters because likely we have and, and, and this is true for manufacturing we will never do a purposeful deviation or variation of process parameters at manufacturing scale. And hence we can only make use out of, um, if we use only manufacturing data, we can only use the tip of the iceberg when it comes to knowledge, because this knowledge we generated in our process development and process characterization work is not usually facilitated in these um, PLS or PCA models as it leads to a sparse data matrix and imputation methods don't really help here. So I, I think this is the really main benefit of connecting um, the unit operations together in an integrated process model versus using um, tools that originally have been developed for chemometrical use cases, completely different and nothing to do with um, a sequential order of unit operations. So to, to probably yeah, sum that up, let's say the SPC is of course, um, say mainly a trajectory. And uh, how I understand that in case you are deviating from this trajectory yeah then you have to sit as an expert 
together to say, oh, where could this trajectory come from? I think Gabriele, you have shown this, right? And you have shown pH, aviation, whatever, but actually then you, the SMEs have to sit together. And the IPM, uh, actually you have the root cause probably even in there that you probably can directly find it out. And it actually, it, it somewhat replaces the, the, the SME. Is this uh, finally uh, the, the solution, right? Mm -hmm. And this would be the, definitely the final goal, yeah. But. Exactly. So probably a question to, to both of you, because uh, we are all very much uh, nerdy in, in terms of modeling. We love that stuff, right? Um, so uh, probably, uh, Gabriele, can you just say something to the acceptance of your approaches in the regulatory uh, framework? Yeah. Well, so that, that's a big topic, but I think, well, we need to separate the... Um, what is used for process monitoring, such as the thing that I presented today to closed loop control. Now, most of the process monitoring, whether that's statistical process monitoring or enabled by a more advanced modeling technique, what you've seen today in my presentation, those are monitoring systems that monitor the behavior of the process within uh, ranges that has been filed as part of the control strategy of the process. So they really look for deviations within a very controlled space of the process. And therefore, that typically doesn't trigger what we call a change control from a regulatory perspective. So when you look at the ICH Q8 or the Q12 guidance, technically, those models are categorized as low impact models, uh, which means that the level of validation required for use of a pharma partner is much lower. Now, when you move to closed loop control instead, that's where the regulatory implications become massive uh, because those automatically become high impact models following regulatory classification. And, uh, and that comes with a certain level of scrutiny and, uh, and validation requirements internally in a company, which can be very demanding. Now, the, the, I think we need to separate between, uh, there is a component of, uh, really in a way almost educating regulators in the sense of making them familiar with the technology. I think closed loop control in terms of model predictive control has historically not been a technology widely adopted in the pharma industry and therefore regulators need to get familiar with that. But there is also a cultural component internal, cultural component on each company where you know, we're a very conservative type of industry and we really like to do things and be 100% sure that we don't have any compliance issues that come with that. And in my view, uh, the internal cultural barrier is sometimes bigger than the regulatory barrier. Uh, in GSK specifically, so in the question, the, there is uh, a big push now to, to move to that closed loop control stage. We have regular engagement with the FDA, European Medicine Agency and other regulators. Um, but it's a journey, so it's not something that I would expect GSK to be able to implement closed loop control for their processes in a year. Yeah. Uh, it's going to take us some time, but it's a journey. Mm -hmm. the, the IPM, Thomas, uh, how would regulate, regulators look at the IPM really for, for example, the application of uh, real-time release of this kind of tool? Yeah, to be honest, uh, real-time release is something probably really for the future, but um, for like basic tasks, um, we employed the IPM um, um, since 2017 in, in a couple of filings um, for different clients. So we have quite a positive feedback here or definitely no negative feedback on that. Um, and I can fully agree with what Gabriela said that it's a probably also an, an educational pathway we need to go um, with the regulators because the, what we sometimes see, no question, is also weird because we sometimes do very heavy statistic stuff. And then uh, once, once you talk on a conference with regulator and regulatory bodies, you realize they don't know the difference between a confidence and a prediction interval, right? And it, it, it's, it's really fascinating at, at some point how, how less educated some of the regulatory bodies are in, in the respect of modeling and this makes also fear, right? Because if you don't know anything about something, you're, you're, you're usually very scared about the new stuff. Mm. Yeah, and let's say as it is, uh, I think to finalize this, this kind of uh, webinar here, um, probably request for a short answer. It's about yeah, implementation of quality by design. Uh, and uh, the industry is not that far. We are all nerdy, we have, we have understood that. Um, yeah, but what are the main obstacles to implement quality by design? Gabriel, you mentioned the culture already. Um, <laughs> what else? Well, I think that's, that's really the main, uh, for me, aspect of it. 
Uh, one, one other maybe thing that uh, I, I would add to that is that sometimes quality by design by pharma companies has been interpreted strictly as doing design of experiments, DOE. There is really an overlap between DOE and quality by design. Uh, that's something that we need together and together with the academic community really to change. Uh, there is still uh, a widespread concept that quality by design means uh, using DOE for each of our process development stages. Mm -hmm. Thomas? Yeah, I, I agree. Culture is very important um, and, and making this culture change not only in the companies, but also in the regulatory bodies. Um, and it, it will be a lot, uh, still a long way um, mm. to, to um, empower everybody and all, all the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. uh, I see, uh, let's say, uh, of course, uh, the real value of quality by design has to be shown in business cases. Gabriele, you mentioned real euro numbers that sometimes helps, okay, in robustness and batch failure. I think that is something we really have to show that quality by design can predict batch failure. Thomas, you have also shown these kind of things. And this is, uh, of course, clear money. And I think we have to show that on that level uh, very much, right? And of course, we uh, finally have to have tools that we actually maneuver inside of the laboriously uh, found design space that we really make use of the complete design space and not just go back to very classical controls again. And then the benefit of uh, QBD is gone. Right? I think this is uh, happening so much. right? And I think uh, both of you, and with this one, I, I thank you so much for your contributions. You both have really shown wonderful tools um, to, uh, to, uh, to, to benefit from the quality by design methodology here. And, uh, you have shown the implementation in um, different cases in the development part in manufacturing. And I thank you so much for your contributions. And I hope that you can share your slide decks with the attendances. Uh, attendances. That would be, uh, I think, very much valuable. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Thomas, Gabriele, yes. thank you. And I give back to Jojo. Yes, I would like, uh, thank you, Christophe. I would like to congratulate you for the for the quality of this presentation. In particular, I would like to, to congratulate uh, Gabriele and Thomas for their work, uh, very impressive and uh, very, I think, uh, I think uh, impressive is the right, uh, right word. Um, you know, full of knowledge, uh, full of uh, um, uh, practical consideration about applications, and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we see that uh, uh, these uh, theoretical methods al allow to improve uh, substantially manufacturing, and we have seen the importance of uh, correct uh, uh, manufacturing in uh, of uh, pharmaceutical in recent times. We, I think, we have all experienced the the the, the need to proceed uh, very expeditiously when we have to face uh, some you know uh, new challenges, as we have uh, all seen in the last years. So. Uh, and by the way, it was a big pleasure for me to, 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 to see GSK name there because many years ago when I was in Singapore, I was working on the multipurpose manufacturing plant uh, of uh, Glaxo that time before the merging uh, that was shown on the map of uh, Gabriele in the first slide. So it was uh, really <laughs> remembering my, my time as um, a chemical engineer a few years ago. So. Thanks uh, to, to everybody and congratulations for the good work done. And uh, thanks to attendees for attending uh, this uh, webinar. I'm sure you have appreciated it as I did. Thanks. Thank thanks, Martina. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.